Welcome to Fry Fest. This is a special honor this afternoon, welcoming one of the special teams in Iowa history that played maybe one of the greatest games in the history of college football. So this is the, uh, got some players here. We're gonna have six of them here that uh, were obviously members of that team. Afterwards, they're gonna be signing autographs right over here to my right. All those, and in addition to the ones that we're bringing up now, there's uh, gonna be uh, Matt Malloy, Marcus Schnorr, Ed Miles, and many others from that team that will be over there. So uh, all at once, uh, 2004 members, why don't you come on up here and sit behind where your name is. And then, once you get, actually get to your seat, turn your names around so they can see it. Everybody knows who Roth is. Don't worry about his name tag. Now, now we know that some of you out there and some of these guys are getting old because I actually see white hair on Warren Holloway. Come on now, what? Silver Fox. <laughs> All right, we're gonna have them uh, stand up here as we uh, bring them along. And uh, first of all, we're gonna do it alphabetically. This guy was a 5'10", 200 pound sophomore. He was a walk-on from Emmitsburg, Iowa, Sam Brownlee. Stand up, now stay standing, stay standing for a second. In 2004, he was the leading rusher. Now wait a minute, you know what guys rush for in a game now. That season, Sam rushed 94 times for a total of 227 yards, zero touchdowns. Come on now. A great running back, Sam Brownlee. We had a lot of guys go down that year, too, and I'm glad you were there. He was the rushing leader in 2005 for Iowa with uh, 1,334, and uh, Albert Young had 1,334, so that tells you where that 227 was that year. He's the first walk-on to start at Iowa running back since 1987. Holy cow. Exactly, yeah. school, house. Now, Mike Humple, you're, you're good friends with this guy in the end here, Matt Malloy. So I'm going to, I didn't, I didn't know for sure he was going to be here, and I don't have the info on you, so I'm going to have you introduce him. Anybody know who that guy is over there on the end? Mount Pleasant's finest. Probably in the running for one of the uh, most impactful splash players in Iowa bowl game history. Stand Locked up it. now, Matt. How many, Matt how many punches you block, Matt? Just one. Just one? Okay. Matt Malloy, everybody. Next, we've got Scott Chandler. Scott, stand up. 6'7", 230 pound tight end from South Lake, Texas. He's a four time letterman, 2003 through 06. Second team All Big Ten. In the 2007 NFL draft, he was a round four selection by San Diego. Nine-year career in the NFL. He played with the Cowboys, the Bills, the Patriots, San Diego. Had a great career in the NFL. And in 2004, he caught 24 passes for the Hawkeyes. Scott Chandler. <laughs> See how times have changed? <laughs> Chad Greenway, Chad, stand up. Four-time letterman for the Hawkeyes, 02 through 05. He was a 6'4", 239-pound linebacker from Mount Vernon, South Dakota. In 2004, he was a second-team All-American. He was a two-time first-team All-Big Ten. 2005, Iowa Most Valuable Player and Team Captain. 
He had 416 career tackles, that's sixth all-time on the Iowa list. In the 2006 NFL Draft, he went in the first round to the Vikings, and he stayed with them the whole time. An 11-year NFL career, a great NFL player, and a great Hawkeye, Chad Greenway. In case you've forgotten, this guy was a 5'10", 188 pound senior from Homewood, Illinois, wide receiver Warren Holloway. Stand up, Warren. Now, he had 33 career receptions. He started every game in 2004. He's a three-time letterman. Yeah, against LSU, he caught four passes for 72 yards. And Warren had one career touchdown. But in our, in our book, that one touchdown puts you at the top of the scoring list for Hawkeyes. Mike Humple. Mike, stand up. Linebacker, 6'2", 230 from New Hampton, Iowa. He was a redshirt freshman on that team. Back injury, back injury kept him out for much of the season that year. In 2007, he was the Iowa captain and he was second team all Big Ten. In the 2008 NFL Draft, he was picked in the sixth round by Pittsburgh. He's a four-time academic all Big Ten player. That's something I couldn't have done. I couldn't have made it once. And a three-time letterman with the Hawkeyes, linebacker Mike Humphrey. Matt Roth, stand up, a four-time letterman. Defensive end for the Hawkeyes. 6'4", 210 from Villa Park, Illinois. First team, all Big Ten, 2003 and 2004. He led Iowa in quarterback sacks in 2002, 2003, in the 2005 NFL Draft. He was picked in the second round by Miami. 2004, he was one of the team captains for the Hawkeyes. And we'll talk about it later, but he really gained infamy for his uh, night before the game message to uh, LSU and uh, <laughs> See? there's certain languages that never change. Now, now how about this one? And, and I don't know if you guys realize it, but what school in the nation, I'm giving myself away, what school in the nation has beaten Nick Saban, three out of the last four times they've played him. <laughs> Fortunately, none of those times were at Alabama, but uh, I feel good if we played Alabama now, we'd probably, you'd probably give them the same signal, wouldn't you? I don't know, it, 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 it would be a, a little rough. Like, you know that uh, 2004 team, it, it was a special team. You had a special group there. It started, we're gonna just give you a little bit of history. The team started out with a couple of wins, but then there were like a couple losses in there. One, uh, ter as Kirk said earlier, a terrible loss to uh, Arizona State down there, a game that was delayed a little bit because of weather. Then we lost to Michigan. The team played pretty well there, but then the team went and played uh, eight straight victories. Eight straight. The team won. That's counting the bowl game. We finished ten and two, seven and one. That senior class won 38 games. So that's uh, something to be proud of. Seven, seven of the 12 teams we played that year were in the top 20. Three, uh, as we said, three of the last four games we've played against Nick Saban, and that obviously was his team, LSU, we've beaten. Now, we were two and two, and then we won the final eight. Five of those wins came by a touchdown or less. Uh, it was the second Big Ten title we won in a total of three years, and we finished eighth in the national polls that year. So. It was a great Iowa team. Uh, it, it didn't start the best way that we'd hoped. We were two and two. A lot of great players on that team. A lot of great friendships. You guys all friends. Uh, 
We're missing another great friend of yours, Chad, Abdul Hodge, today, you know, one of the great players on that team. But uh, we'll talk about the game later, but let, let's uh, go on. Uh, we're going to start right here with Matt. We're going to go right down the line. Tell me what you remember most about your memories, uh, you know, the camaraderies, your coaching, every, what do you, grab the mic there, and what do you remember most about 2004? 2004, um, just everybody on the team were great friends. Uh, we always had each other's back, and, um, you know, we just had a ne never say die attitude, and you know, going out there, we knew we could compete with anybody, and uh, we always found a way to win. Sam Brownlee. Yeah, I'd say that uh, I guess the team I thought in 04 had a really good chemistry and, uh, you know, we obviously uh, lost a lot of people uh, in my position. So uh, everybody kind of uh, got together and uh, and came up with the plays we needed when we needed it the most in a lot of those close games to win and uh, and kind of uh, kind of echoes the whole attitude of the team of how uh, how we, we kind of came together to win uh, and got the plays done when we needed, to, needed them to be done. So You know, Sam's a pretty good example of, uh, if you go back earlier, you remember that old saying we had next man in. You know, we had a lot of running backs hurt that year, and he came in, and, and we didn't miss a beat with him. We maybe didn't have a 1,000-yard rusher, <laughs> but when we needed a yard or two or three, Sam was the guy that did it. We had a runner similar to that to about – uh, would have been about 17 years earlier, and his name was Rick Bayless. You know, he took over uh, for the Hawkeyes at running back and did a great job when some guys got hurt. But Warren, go ahead. Um, one thing that one thing that I remember from the 2014, just kind of piggybacking on what these guys said, and I'm going to speak offensively here. Um, you know, we thought that was going to be a year where we were going to run the ball like usual, and we had some injuries, and we had a bit of uh, an identity deal to deal to come to terms with, uh, as you saw in that Arizona game. And, you know, just real hats off to the guys to just kind of rallying around the changes that need to be made, the coaching staff, and we were able to find an identity moving forward. And uh, luckily we had a quarterback like Drew who liked to throw the ball around because that's what we needed that year. And uh, I just, oh, that's much better. All right. Should I just should I just start over? <laughs> so what I remember from that 2014 was that um, we thought we were going to run the ball just like we had done in 02 and 03, and when we had the injuries come in, uh, we had guys like Brownlee and, and Biggins and so forth step up, and uh, unfortunately we had a quarterback like Drew who used to throw in the ball, and the coaches have made adjustments, but we had a real uh, identity deal to uh, offensively to deal with as you saw in the Arizona game but after that game the changes were made and it was really nice to see the offense come together in a way that was different than from some of the other Iowa offenses that you've seen and I just remember that especially being a receiver appreciating that playing in one of the years where Iowa really had to throw the ball so that's what I appreciate kind of just yeah it was certainly a special year Hot mic, yeah. It was certainly a special year in a lot of ways, and I think the biggest thing is you, you look back at that season and you look at the talent we had on the roster, like you mentioned. Um, defensively, really at every level, we had high-level NFL players, um, and it was pretty special to look back at the, the roster that we had and to see what those guys ended up being, uh, whether it be NFL careers or collegiate careers. It was certainly a special group, but I think the biggest thing, I can remember a conversation with Coach Ferentz after we lost to Michigan and were 2-2. Two and two. He pulled some of us aside after that game and really t asked us as starters to buy in on special teams. And we actually added um, more special teams plays from the starting group just to be able to try to do more and to bring the team along because we had had two really successful seasons the year before. We weren't quite as deep as the previous two years. So we needed all hands on deck. And I think it's a true testament just to how Coach Ferentz builds the team, how Chris Doyle builds the team as far as strength and conditioning. Really just to, you know, for us to push strong and get better as the year went on and win the final eight games was pretty amazing. Um, but it was a pretty special year all the way around. Uh, and to find a way to, to win a game at
Chip off the old block. Yeah. Bamboo will fall far from the tree. Uh, I'll be honest. I don't remember most of the games. Uh, just don't. Maybe it may hit that. Or, but I do remember hanging out with the guys. I remember their wives. Now that uh, we're all grown up. I remember hanging out after the games. I remember hanging out in the pet mall. Specifically, but uh, it was a group of guys that I truly I call brothers, and I love being around and uh, bring a smile to my face today. Seeing them all, I haven't seen them in a while, so uh, I remember the friendships. I remember the fans. I remember uh, the coaching staff and all the great uh, relationships that we uh, we made over the years, and that's truly what sticks out, you know, and. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to say I'm a Hawkeye and proud to say that these guys are my brothers. As one of the younger players on the team that year, with a lineup of guys like this up here and then some, uh, it was a, the thing I remember of 04 was those are the guys I got to look up to and, and learn from. You know, Chad Abdul at the linebacker position specifically. So that, that was kind of the most memorable thing, is learning how they competed, how they trained, how they prepared every day. Uh, and then also piggybacking off what, what Chad said earlier about the Michigan game, that was kind of a, a pivot point in that season. I remember Coach Ferentz, correct me if I'm wrong guys, but we uh, took that game film and buried it in the dirt out on the practice field. And uh, it was just kind of, I mean literally, shovel, dug a hole, buried it. It was there, just like, hey, you know, we're, we're going to, Close those. We're gonna forget about this. We buried these memories. We had two, you know, two tough losses, and uh, and then that just changed the whole trajectory of that season. So it's, it's, that was kind of a memorable moment that year that most people, you know, aware of. John. Yeah, I think the thing that really, really stuck out to me about that year was just the resiliency of our team. You know, going down to Arizona State, I think we thought that we were we were pretty hot and stuff. And, uh, we found out real quickly. We had a ways to go. Um, 49 to 7. And it was like 49 to nothing until we returned to Hunt. It was one of those bizarre games. Well, like, I'll never forget. The, the thunderstorm happened right when the game was supposed to start. I think we kicked off at like 10.30 Central. Oh, I wish we would have just gone to bed. Uh, but, you know, come back the next week, go up to Michigan, fight like hell, and come up a little short. Uh, and then, just to see our defense step up, you know, I think that a lot of times when you think about the 2004 season, people think about, you know, the, the offense had to throw the ball. And all, but our defense played amazing the entire year, forced tons of turnovers, uh, and then special teams uh, made, made big plays. Uh, I mean, I think about in the capital one bowl, the, the punt block. Well, those, those are things that are huge for an offense because I mean, we, we were struggling a little bit. Uh, and anytime the defense can get you points, especially to get you points, it's, it's just a, a great team effort. And, uh, what we needed to do to, to win those games. And, you know, we found a way to win some close games there. We even won a game 6-4. to four. Okay. Six to four. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I don't know if we found a way to win 6-4. Uh, to four. We, we did that day. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember that, and then the other thing I remember about the 2004 season didn't have anything to do with football, really, but Roth and I had a softball class together, and uh, he used to give me a ride on the back of his moped in softball class every day, so if you guys were lucky enough, it was like 8 o'clock, because uh, we were probably a little late in class. Um, we went through the Hardee's drive through one time on the moped. <laughs> Roth hooked me up with breakfast, so that was, that was the nicest thing he ever did for me. <laughs> You hate to bring up, but that 6-4 game to Penn State, that's the same week that Kirk Ferentz lost his father. And uh, the team had a little uh, little more impetus that week to do something for the coach. Because I remember uh, Kirk and Brian and the rest of the family, I believe, 
came from uh, their hometown in Pennsylvania from the funeral on the Friday and uh, obviously coached and played on uh, Saturday. But uh, nonetheless, 6-4 game was a great, uh, that, that was a great motivator for the team. Now, I'd like to ask Chad, you were one of the uh, senior statesmen uh, for that team. One guy we don't have with us now, how big of a motivator was Norm Parker at that time? Yeah, Norm was a special, special guy. And those, those of you who were on the iClub circuit got a chance to meet or hear Norm speak. He was a special guy in a lot of ways. Uh, had a great way with humor, uh, but also as a coach, he had a great way of putting things in perspective. And um, you know, whether it be who he's recruiting and the talent level, you know, finding a, a two-star recruit in South Dakota and making him a good player, um, he had a way of, he had a way about him that people loved. It was very endearing. But for him, it was always about carrying the right mentality. And I think. Um, I think Scott really said it best when he talked about how resilient we were as a team. He looked at Norm and just what he is as a person, what he was as a person, who he was as a man. Um, he was a resilient, stubborn old man. And, um, but we loved him. We all loved him so much, whether he's an offensive player or a defensive player. You love Norm and what he stood for. And, and uh, to me, like all those teams that, that we're a part of, or I was a part of specifically, um, we kind of embodied who Norm was and what he was all about and uh, try to be resilient, tough, do our job, to be smart, um, get Roth lined up, and um, everything else would take care of itself. And uh, um, That's, That was gonna be one of my questions. How did Norm get somebody like Matt to do what he wanted? <laughs> no, I'm not gonna give Matt the mic here. Uh, he's the, let me tell you something about Matt, though. Matt is a, is a phenomenal football player, first of all, but he's a great friend. A uh, guy that would always be there for you no matter what you needed. Uh, I could probably call him right now. I haven't seen him in a decade. But if I needed something from Matt and I was in Minnesota, he would get there and he would help me. That's just the type of friend and bond that you create when you go through seasons and teams like we were a part of, recruiting classes that we were a part of. Um, but that's the bond you have. But it takes a special guy to get, math, uh, to get Matt to do what you're supposed to do, and Norm was that guy. Are, are you saying Matt went to classes? Don't let this guy fool you over here. He's a smart man. I know he is. I know he is. And he's a great Hawkeye. Okay, we're going to go down the line here. We're going to talk about the game a little later, but we're just going to go down the line. I want each of you to tell the crowd what you're doing now, what your profession is, and uh, your family, if you have, if you're married, if you have kids, et cetera. Just, you know, in a capsule, tell them a little bit about yourself. Sure. So, um... I met my wife, Katie. She's somewhere out here. Uh, when I was at the peak of my coolness, um, I way out punted my coverage on that one. Uh, we have three little boys, uh, Max and Maddox and Maverick, nine, seven, and four. Uh, we live here in Coralville, Iowa. Um, been here for every, every year since I graduated, graduated, except for one, I moved to Wichita for a year and I decided that wasn't for me. Um, Currently, I'm a regional manager for a medical device company. I travel and cover six states. Yeah, I'm, uh, I moved home uh, to work in a family farm operation and farm management company that my family's had for generations. Uh, so it's been fun for me to get back into a uh, into family farm business. And uh, that's located in Emmitsburg, where I grew up. Uh, married my wife Hannah, who's a uh, dental grad here at the university, and uh, we have one son, Bo, who's 17 months, and we have a, uh, another kid on the way in the next two weeks, if not before. So, uh, uh, I was getting a text this morning that my wife was having some mild contractions, so she's a little nervous, but uh, I decided to come in. Well, good luck to you. Settled back in um, uh, Des Plaines, Illinois, just north of Chicago. Um, I'm a physical therapist, managing a clinic in Glenview, Illinois. Uh, just started that, so I'm excited to start that new career. And uh, I have two little girls, two under two, right back home. Uh, they wanted to come out today, but they're not old enough yet. Uh, maybe next year. That's the one. Jenny uh, is over here somewhere. We, uh, we met at Iowa. She was uh, the captain of the track team. 
uh, for two years. So we have four daughters, 12, 9, 4, and 2. Um, they're going to be Hawkeyes someday, so get ready for the Women's Sports Pro. Going to take a boost here the next uh, half hour. And uh, we live up in Wyzetta, Minnesota. We settled in there after I retired. Uh, we love it up there, other than the whole gopher thing. But we fly our Hawkeye flags loud and proud. Um, and I am now owner and operator of Grey Duck Vodka. We sell here in Iowa. We're in five states. We launched that last year. Um, signings tomorrow at Hy-Vee. You want to come check us out. We're signing bottles at Hy-Vee tomorrow at Cross Park uh, Hy-Vee. So uh, come check out our new product. Are you giving away free bottles of scotch <laughs> or vodka? <laughs> I, uh, like Matt, I'll kick my coverage. My beautiful wife is somewhere in the audience. I got uh, two smoke show daughters. That's why I got this young stud to uh, take over so I can retire as champ. Fighting game. Um, I'm currently retired. I plan on staying retired. And uh, I've been reduced to Brock and Kenny and Sloan's dad, which I uh, appreciate greatly. Uh, could be happier. My wife is not here. Uh, she's working since I had to take the afternoon off. But uh, and watching our two little rugrats. Uh, we got a three-year-old boy and a one-year-old daughter. With a third one on the way in November. So just trying to keep up with Chandler crew here. Um, I've got a chiropractic office uh, in North Liberty, just up the road. So. Still in the, in the area. I'm married an Iowa girl at college, Alyssa. She's over there trying to keep the my littlest one, uh, Ryan. Uh, I have three daughters, uh, 10, 8, and 5, and my son is 3. I uh, live here in Morgan Liberty. Uh, and I own a real estate investment business uh, with, with my brother Nathan, Chandler Real Estate Investments. And, uh, Equity for real estate. And as we said, things started out a little shaky for the Hawkeyes this that year. We won two, but then things took a downturn. What, you know, and just raise your hand if you want to speak to it. You talked about Barry in the film. We had some great athletes on that team, but what, uh, what was maybe the one thing, or what, in, in your mind, turned it around? Was it was there, was there a game or a a moment that uh, made you think, wait a minute, we we really have something going here? I just think I think with that team, the hard, the biggest thing was we had a lot of talent, um, but we also had everybody on that team, no matter how good they were, what they had accomplished, had no ego, and I think that just kind of epitomizes what you know a, Coke, a Kirk Ferentz led team. Is like, and I think when you have a team like that, you have a chance to go out there and accomplish a lot of a lot of goals that um, maybe are overreaching for the quality of team that we had. But we always found a way. We're very blue collar, had a great work ethic mentality, and no matter what happened around us, with the injuries to taking a couple tough losses, we never let anything bother us. We just kept charging ahead. We were an extremely close group. Um, I would say of all the teams, that was probably the, the team that was maybe the closest that I played for in the four years. Um, and I think that's really just that bond, really with those tight games. You mentioned how many games we won by seven points or less. A lot of times it comes down to one or two plays. And just that bond and that work ethic that we had throughout that year really pushed us through. Yeah, let me ask Sam Brownlee something. That was a team, Kirk prides himself on being a 50-50 coach. You know, passing, you know, having an equal part. But that year we had to go mostly to the pass and how did you feel about your your role because we did have what two or three running backs that got hurt yeah i was uh, well i was kind of the last man standing it seemed like and uh so i got uh, i got lucky that year to, to be involved in, in uh, playing a lot and uh being thrown into a role that uh you know i, I was ready for it, uh mostly just uh reiterating what everybody else says about coach parents and the staff of uh, how ready i felt as a player for them uh, getting me ready and uh, just mentally and physically to be able to compete at such a high level with these, you know, athletes that played 10, 12 years in the NFL. So uh, I guess for me, uh, it, was, uh, it was a great, uh, great honor for me to be involved in it. And uh, I think that, like Chad was saying, you know, sure we didn't 
we, we weren't, you know, the, the team that was the sexiest, and we, but we came together and, and made the plays, especially on offense with you know, running the ball as much. You know, Drew made a lot of plays. Uh, it was great to have the defense make so many plays and turnovers that got us into situations to make the plays to win games, and, and a lot of those plays come down to small, you know, last second catches or, uh, or first downs that needed, and, uh, and then kind of everything came together in those moments, and, and that team had such a bond, like Chad was saying, that to uh, make those things really come together. Matt, let me ask you, what was the feeling of the team? A delay in the start of the game. We got killed, I think, 49 or 42 to 7 against Arizona State. It was a punt return. It was the only reason we scored, I think, in the last minute of the game. What was the feeling coming home on that plane ride then? Yeah, you know, it was a, a pretty quiet, somber feeling. You know, it's one of those games that nothing went right. Um, no matter what we did, it kind of the ball bounce go the right way for Arizona State and the wrong way for us. And, you know, anytime you can put as much effort and um, hard work into what we do, and you lose a game like that, you know, it's you question things, you, you think about what, what you could have done different, but um, it was a sombering moment for us to come home, uh, but we knew you know, there's a, it's a long season and there was a lot of games ahead, so just put it behind us and move on. Well, it's like Kirk said, I don't know, I'm not sure how many of you attended the iClub luncheon today right here at the Marriott, but he says we got like seven, eight, nine games into the season, and, and he said in a coaching meeting, they sat there and they said, Oh my, you, did you ever think that if we keep doing this, we may end up in a spot where we're playing a team that is just out of this world and it just, you know, much better than us. And, and maybe that's what happened because we ended up winning the last seven games of that year. Okay, now we're going to move to the Capital One Bowl. Uh, LSU, obviously a good team. The night before, Matt told the LSU team and, you know, coach uh, what, what, what he thought of, of their chances of beating us. And so they, it wasn't very good. But anyway, I mean, as Hayden Fry used to say, you know, if, if you've done it, you ain't bragging. So, uh, you know, we went out and we did it. But going into that game, what was the feeling? This is a team that was national champions. I believe the year before, and a pretty good team. Nick Saban, obviously a, a great coach. Uh, he had great talent that year, but uh, let, let's go down the line one more time. What was your feeling going into that LSU game? We, we were obviously were the underdog in that game. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, collectively as a team, we, we felt confident in, in our team and what we could do against them. We knew it would be a, a big battle and a huge fight against them. Um, you know, and we just we thought if we executed our game plan, we'd have a chance to win. You know, the one thing that was consistent about our teams is, except for the Arizona game, is we would never get blown out of a game. We we're always in the game. So we did the things that we needed to do. We knew we'd, be, we'd have a chance to win in the end. Yeah, I think that uh, I think the feeling of the team that year, uh, especially towards the end of the season, when we were winning a lot of games, was that you know we weren't cocky, like uh, Chad was saying, but we were confident and we thought we were, we thought we were a good team, you know, good players, and we thought we could really compete with anybody. And we did know that LSU was going to be a tough challenge, but I think that uh, our mindset was you know, we could make the plays to win and uh, we could beat anybody, really. Uh, honestly, I think we were excited to play LSU. Uh, when you go to a ball game, you want to play a high-profile team. Uh, you want to perform well. Uh, we knew what we could do, and uh, we were just really excited to play them. Uh, and we were really excited to play against a team that they thought were too fast and so much more talented and so forth. Uh, but to go out there and execute a game plan and, and do our game, we were really excited to, to make that happen. So uh, I think there was a doubt in our mind. Yeah, I think uh, when, you're, when you're down there for bowl week, you do a lot of events, cross events with the other team. So we do, you know, different things. You eat dinner and other other activities, and you can get a sense uh, by going to those events that they did not respect us at all. So I think the best part about that win was the fact that 
we got we got more confident as the week got on, and I felt because we saw that they were overconfident, they saw us walk into whatever we were doing, and they thought they had no chance they were going to lose to us. Uh, in a true uh, true fashion of why football is great is we did it by playing together as a team, all three phases won. Um, we had success, and, and I think that's the best part about beating arrogant teams like that from the South, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, is because we were able to do it as a team together uh, the way we were supposed to do it. So that's what made that fun. Hold on, he's got something to say. Quick. I just got one thing to say. Let's go Hawks, am I right? I thought he was going to swear there. Uh, I had to say with Chad, uh, going into the game, playing high caliber teams, I thought they always looked down upon us. I think they never took us seriously because we're from Iowa. And uh, there was nothing better than putting Iowa on the map in a big game like that and uh, proving to them that uh, our physicality would overmatch their speed or you know, they always thought they were faster or more skilled than us. So to uh, beat up on those teams was the best. And uh, physically oppose our will on them was, uh, there was nothing better. Truly great. And, and Kurt did say earlier today there's a lot of similarities between that game and when we played Mississippi State last year because at a lot of the team functions, they there were cases where they were, you know, they were spotted even laughing at our players, thinking they weren't quite as good as uh, us. But I guess obviously we had the last laugh in both cases. Mike, go ahead. I can remember there were just never. Everybody was bought in. I mean, not just the starters, but everyone, the, the whole team, all the scout team, everyone, um, and just really focused that whole week. And uh, we, you know, you, obviously, you said, hey, you're playing the defending national champions. It's it's. Uh, you, know, you got everybody's attention, so we were all hungry and um, wanted to show what we could do too. Off subject, just a little bit, because I don't know if there'll be enough time to share it. At the uh, uh, beginning of that season, the 04 season, the seniors get up and talk every year at the end of summer camp, just kind of address the team in the team room. And, uh, I remember Warren's speech. Was it never a big talker, you know, long-winded guy or nothing? Maybe changed a little bit now, but he. Uh, the one thing Warren said, and this is, this is pre-catch, right? Warren says, uh, giving 100% on this team doesn't make you special, it makes you part of the team. So, I mean, that was the kind of mentality that guys like Warren and all the way through had that was contagious, and I think what really held everybody together that year to, to make a successful season. And I think other people have used Warren's quote through the years, including uh, Chris Doyle, in that so, uh, it's carried on through the years, Warren. Scott? Yeah, I, mean, I think these guys touched on uh, you know, everything about that game. Uh, you know, I, I still get goosebumps every time I look at the picture, the panoramic picture, you know, where it says Warren catching the ball and, and running into the end zone. You can see Hinkle and me running right, and we're trying to catch it. But, you know, we get down there, and you know, the team's coming to dog pile. And I saw the team coming, so I backed away because I don't like to be at the bottom of the dog pile. But I, I was there on the outside cutting. But, but then you, you look at that picture, though, and the best thing to do is look at the stands. You look at all the LSU fans' faces. They're all just, you can't believe what happened. And the Hawkeye fans are right next to them, going nuts. And, uh, man, I can get goosebumps now just thinking about it every single time. It doesn't get old. We're really excited to be here to celebrate this team and get to do that together and just enjoy it. Okay, now we're going to... First of all, tell us, uh, Scott, what's your brother Nate doing now? Former Iowa quarterback. Yeah, he lives in Dallas, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, our hometown. Uh, he has five kids, four boys uh, and a girl. And, uh, but he and I own a, own a company together, so we work together. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you, uh, two days ago I spoke with uh, Coach Fry, and he wanted to send his love to everybody here because of his health, 
he and Shirley, they cannot make it. I don't know if they'll ever make it to a Fry Fest again, but he wanted to tell you how much he misses being here with all of you. And his uh, last line was, Go Hawks. So uh, he's doing well. He loves you all, and he's, he'll be a Hawkeye till the end. One thing we, want, we do want to mention, uh, in addition uh, to these guys, signing autographs over here when we're uh, done will be Cody Osmus, Tom Bush, Ben Cronin, Ed Hinkle, Jermel Lewis, Pete McMahon, Ed Miles, and Marcus Schnorr. So uh, they'll be over there signing along with these guys. And uh, so stop over, get their autograph. Okay, now we're going to move on to, uh, I guess it'd be the last 30 seconds of that game. Now, I'm, I'm going to start with the... The, the defense here and what what, what do you what did you guys uh, think going going in uh, obviously you probably didn't have much as what's going on but let let's say uh, I mean we're what 15 years after the fact did you think we're we're toast or what what was your thoughts well we were we had lead, led the game all the way through and uh, Jamarcus Russell um, came in around halftime I think or before halftime I can't remember exactly but. Um, been a lot of football games since then. But I remember right is we had the lead and defensively we had played really well and then we gave up the lead at the end. Obviously a long drive, they score to take the lead, uh, which then in turn sets up Warren. Um, so you're welcome for us giving that touchdown now. <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't my fault, but they scored. But basically I remember walking the sidelines and everybody being so upset. Obviously we had played so well and they gave up the, the touchdown to, to potentially lose the game. And I can remember, you know, kind of having my helmet off and just being upset and then realizing that the clock wound down, that this was going to be the final play and everybody's screaming to call a timeout and everybody's just panicking. And the, oh, thankfully, at least two people knew what was going on um, and what they had a plan to do. And then Drew snaps it and, and uh, you know, you just basically see the ball in the air and you see Warren run under it. And it's just like, it was just chaos from a defensive standpoint. But for us, we had, we felt like we let everybody down, obviously, to play well all season. But then not to play well when it mattered the most was disappointing, but thankfully they picked us up. Well, and as Kirk has said many times, their quarterback got on a roll. No matter what we did defensively, it wasn't going to make a difference because he was threading the needle wherever he threw the ball. Matt? Yeah, I remember at the second half, they made the quarterback switch, and uh, I beat the tackle, came around, and hit the quarterback with everything I had. And the guy just shrugged me off and threw a 65 yard bomb out there. Wish I was out. Uh, so uh, we, we, we played tough and uh, they went up that score. And I remember walking off the sideline. I kind of threw my helmet down. I was like, I'm going to go out with a loss on my senior year. And uh, I kind of had the poor me. So I was looking down. And then all of a sudden, everyone started jumping up and down. And I was trying to watch the Jumbotron but it was on like a five second delay. So I was like, damn, everyone's in the end zone. Must, some must have been So I was, I was trying to ask everyone that was next to me what happened, what happened, but everyone was running towards the end zone. I just ran with them. Come down the way that we won, so I was like, whoa. And then I obviously watched the highlights later that day. I was like, holy cow, man. Everyone came through with a huge, uh, huge catch. Real similar to, to Ross' story is I'm, I'm standing there on the sideline and we're on the far right side and the, the touchdown happens on the, the, the left end of whatever direction that was. And uh, everybody, like the offense is over there and, and half the defense and everybody just starts taking off. And I'm like, I couldn't see what was going on necessarily either. I wasn't the front row on the sideline. I'm you know, back there. And uh, so everybody just takes off. I'm like, well, I gotta assume he's in the end zone. So we'll <laughs> I mean, everybody just takes off running, and, and Scott said earlier, big dog pile too. I tried not to get caught up in that, but it worked so well. So, Scott, now one from the other side, what went on in the huddle, or in the in the meeting on the sideline or whatever, just as we're coming up to that final play? So I think we were. I mean, it was one or two point game uh, when we got the ball back, and yeah, yeah. So we had. 
we had two timeouts, and we had 49 seconds or something. Uh, so honestly, like, Schleicher could pick the ball, you know, if we got it to the, if we got it to the 35 or even 40 yard line, he had a big enough leg. So I, I didn't think we were in that bad shape. And uh, hit a first down, uh, first throw, people got a first down, the clock stopped, we got to go up, call another play, hit like a nine yard pass, and uh, had to get up and, and spike it. We got the procedure. Uh, that that caused a little bit of confusion because the clock was going to start again when we got when the ball got ready to be snapped. And we had a play called and everything, so I mean, it, at least it wasn't like just just us running. Like we did have a play call, um, but obviously the clock was running and Drew saw that and knew, and I have to I have to throw it uh, all the way down the field. And, Luckily, LSU got confused enough by it, too, that they blew the coverage. You know, they had two safeties running with the slowest guy on the field. Me. I went right down the seat. And uh, so that was great. And Hinkle got a good little uh, seal-off block after he caught it, and it was, it was just pandemonium. Let's move it back down this way now. <clears throat> Question for Warren. How was that, Doc Powell? You got to yeah, like, explain we're, we're going to get to Warren last, and he, you, can, you can tell on, on that one. Sam, what? Uh, I remember the dog pile because I was one of the first guys that jumped on the pile, and I ended up at the bottom. And I, I've never been feared for my life more than in that moment. I think I was grasping for air, and I must have had 1,000 pounds on top of me at least. And that, was, that was not a fun moment. But uh, I remember, uh, I think I was in maybe the first play of the series, and then uh, I think it was Tom Bush was in when, when the catch uh, happened and and uh, I made the rookie mistake of running down off the sidelines and being I, I don't think I ever ran that fast the whole year and, and uh, <laughs> then jumped on the pile and, uh, but I do remember I don't know if uh, I don't think Drew would mind me saying this uh, in confidence he told me no I was really throwing it to him <laughs> No, I think, um, like Scott said, we had plenty of time. We were down by one or two points, and uh, we thought we could get a field goal with Canyon's leg, and you know, we were moving the ball. Um, time got away from us, and uh, I remember when the ball was in the air, looking down, and I'm like, Warren, I don't know if anybody knows this, I don't believe Warren dropped a pass this senior year that was thrown to him. So I was thinking in my mind, Warren, don't, don't drop it now. <laughs> He caught it, which we knew, knew he would. Um, and he, he knew, we knew he was getting in the end zone. So, and, and I made the same mistake as Sam did. And I was on the bottom of that pile and I could not breathe. Got, my mouth got cut up. Um, and all I could think about is this is how I'm gonna die. <laughs> um, but, but thankfully, uh, guys like Roth didn't jump on top of me. And uh, I made it to celebrate that night. Now we're going to go to uh, Warren Holloway, and I, I, I do remember, Warren, you, you talk about being emotional. You were talking after the game, and I remember one thing you said. He, he said, I'm going to go through, you were thinking before, I'm going through my whole Hawkeye career, and I'm not going to score a touchdown. Not one. And it happened on the last play of your career. So tell me your thoughts going into that final play. I mean, obviously, you didn't know if you were even going to touch the ball. Yeah, to be honest, uh, that play was called for uh, Solomon on the backside. And we were expecting to get him the ball and then kick a field goal and, and go up by two points. Um, and thank you for confirming my suspicion. <laughs> I've told this story uh, a few times. And I've always suspected that Hinkle was getting the ball. I mean, he, the, the trajectory when he let it off and let it go, I thought, oh, he was getting the ball, you know. But, um, but in any, any event, you know, I caught the pass before, uh, we're in the huddle, and um, I don't, I personally didn't notice that the clock was running down, uh, but we did notice that the defense didn't know what was going on. And I noticed Drew noticing that, and we just hurried up, we all kind of noticed it, and we just hurried up and ran to play. It was kind of serendipitous in that way. Um, and then I saw um, uh, play was hiked or whatever, uh, I got off of my jam, I saw the safety go down to Chandler, 
and then I knew the covers was blown because there's nobody on me. You know, he didn't run it with me, so I figured, okay, here we go. Uh, and so, uh, Drew let the ball go. I said, oh, he's throwing the hinkle, okay, that's cool. But then, <laughs> that's, that's usually how it goes. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then the ball stopped right over my head. It just stopped right over my head. And I said, all right, well, somebody in a black and gold jersey has to catch this ball. So I'll just cruise up underneath it and see how it goes. <laughs> And I, I really expected the, the safety to come and take me out as soon as I caught the ball. Uh, but he didn't. And uh, I found a little pat on the back, which was the LSU guy. And it felt like three steps in the end zone. Then it went by really fast. So it was, it was a very, uh, it was very, very surreal. Very surreal. Well, That was after that game where they said Warren Holloway would never have to buy his own beer the rest of his life. I don't know. I'm not sure if you're buying your own now or uh, maybe in Chicago they they forgot about it. Maybe maybe not the greatest football team ever. Maybe not the greatest Iowa football team ever, but possibly the greatest football game ever. And these guys were all a part of it. So thank you to you and all of the other players that are going to sign autographs and we're going to start it right now the autograph session thank you all for being here and thank you 2014